Thank you for watching this online class presentation from Cedarville University. Cedarville's faculty members are highly credentialed and challenge their students to perform at the highest level for a God-honoring purpose. Students are taught by former military and business leaders, award-winning composers, accomplished authors, and ministers of the gospel. We invite you to learn more at cedarville.edu. Okay. All right, guys. So we're into this doctrine of revelation. The doctrine of revelation just means that we're thinking about God manifesting himself, making himself known and visible to us as humanity, creation. So there are two kinds of revelation. And what are they? I said last time. Natural and special. Good. So natural revelation comes out in two different ways. And what are those? Creation and conscience. Good. So in Romans 1, especially we see creation displaying the greatness of God, showing who he is. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. Then Romans 2 says our conscience bears witness that we know right and wrong, good and evil, displaying our, our attuning to this through God and his grace. Now, what's the problem with natural revelation for the natural person? Yeah, Noah. Well, it can tell us, it can show us like the problem, but it can't show us the solution. Right, so it shows us the problem, or even shows us that there is a God, but solution isn't there in totality. And what else do we do with this natural revelation, according to Romans 1? You guys remember this? Yeah. We suppress it, right? As, the, as a natural, unsaved person, we can see creation, space. So in the macro level, the microscopic level, all this crazy stuff, just... I mean, I'm not an expert by any stretch, but the irreducible complexity of the eye is, is just crazy to study and think through and say, that just came about by random chance. But what we do is we suppress these things and say, no, 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 there can't be a creator or a God. Why would somebody naturally want to suppress that, do you think? There are a number of reasons. Like, why would we want to suppress creation, order, cause, effect? There must be a creator. What would in us want to suppress that? Yeah. A need for control. I want to be in control and not have somebody else be in control. I understand that. And I think, yeah. Uh, they have to take the truth that they don't want to know. Yeah, so there's a truth. They've thought something all their lives and something to say, I was wrong and this is correct instead. Any others? Why well, we suppress this and not want to go this way? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of rooted in pride, too, right? We have to do <laughs> nothing in that. There's all this yeah, so it's like the inferiority of me, the superiority of this creator, and in that, there's a call then for me to, whatever this creator says or demands, I'm called to submit to. And naturally, we're, like, the word submission just feels dirty in all of our mouths, right? We, we feel that, like, I don't want to have to submit to anybody. We feel this kind of tension in us there. So there are reasons why we would suppress that and say, I'm going to go this way instead. So instead of worshiping God, according to Romans 1, again, uh, what do we do? We take creation and we turn it into gods of our own fashioning and worship them instead. Everyone on planet Earth is a worshiper. Everyone on planet Earth, to use a general as a term, everyone is religious in nature. Uh, everyone brings their gods to bear on all areas of life. So this is the reality of natural revelation. We went through last time, again, creation and conscience, went through all these historic figures like Luther and Calvin and Aquinas, Carl F. H. Henry. So now move on to this section on, on theological synthesis, if you will. I'm trying to summarize theologically what's going on with this doctrine. I'm going to end with that question I talked about on Wednesday. Okay, but what about those who've never heard the gospel? And like their only exposure is this natural revelation. Like, what do we do with that? We'll come there in a few minutes, which there may be questions that arise at that point, and that'll be good and fine. So, let's summarize here. In creation, human nature, God reveals himself, showing one glorious, powerful, and moral God exists. All right, so, I am the Lord, there is no other the heavens declare the glory of God, right? this one God who exists over all things. The second, that he is creator, and so we are responsible before him. He has the right then, creator, creation, he has the right then to demand certain things of us, demand an accounting of us, of how we've used the life he gave to us. So this is 
This is the prerogative of a parent in a much lesser sense. I come home, some days I get texts during the day, oh, your son. Whenever like, the text goes, your son or your daughter, you know it's not a good day. And I'm like, well, are you saying those are my issues too? Yes, she is. Anyway, so, um, so I, I, I get this text uh, telling me here's what's going on, here's what we faced. My poor wife, God bless her, she's amazing, amazing. Um, she, we homeschool, and so she'll deal with things at 9.45 in the morning, and by the time I get home at 4.30, my kids are like, Daddy, how's it going? It was a great day today. And my wife's like, oh, <laughs> come on now. But it's been a long time, because they had some breakdown, meltdown, and then hours later, they're, they're all good to go. So anyway, we talked through all this. When I get home, uh, they give an accounting to Daddy. That's how this works. So I, 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 will use, I will use the phrase, like, to my son especially, did you mouth off to my wife today? I won't say to his mom, I'll say my wife. So he knows, like, this is my wife. Do not mess with my wife. I want him to know that, because there's a particular kind of relationship going on. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, so with that, <laughs> with that, in a much greater sense, again, all of creation, everything in heaven, on earth and under the earth will bow the knee and say Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's true. We will give an accounting to him. Third, we're sinners disobeying the moral law within and rejecting the knowledge of God given in that creation. That's the issue. That's the fundamental rub we have in creation is that God's there. He's glorious. He made us for his glory. We discussed all this from Isaiah 43 and elsewhere. And the problem is we want to live for our glorious sinful people. That's the issue. Going on here. The scriptures teach that because of our fallen nature, we don't clearly perceive God's revelation. That because of the fallen nature of creation, God's revelation is distorted in our minds and we twist it to our own ends. Again, this is in various Places. So while general or natural revelation is sufficient to render us without excuse before God, and I'll, I'll read this. I want to make sure you guys hear this phrase in Romans 1. I'll start in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed against, from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. What does that, what does that phrase mean? They're without excuse in what sense? To what end? Yeah. Probably without moral excuse, meaning that they are responsible for their actions. Okay, so moral excuse and that they're, they're, they're uh, accountable for their actions, right? When will all of humanity give an account of their actions? At, at this thing we call the final judgment, right? Where we'll all stand before God, read Revelation 20, right? And we'll give an accounting to him of this. And I think in that moment, Paul's anticipating, it's that moment where all humanity stands before God with that natural revelation in mind and says, you are without excuse, that's the idea. So, the question here, one question at least, we're without excuse, but is natural revelation sufficient to save us? Again, I said last time, my answer would be no, it's not. You can't look at a tree or a plant or an animal or outer space and deduce a Trinitarian God, the Father who sends the Son and the power of the Spirit to make atonement for sins by death and resurrection. That's not where we're going to get that from. So natural revelation leaves us in a place that says, oh my, we are lacking, and praise God, he gave us this thing called special revelation right here, baby. Right? So we have this book where as unbelievers, we need this truth to be saved, and as believers, we need this truth to be continually sanctified and transformed into his likeness. I'm in numbers right now. You know what I mean? And, and numbers, I mean, it has a transformative effect on us as we take in the God of the universe by means of numbers. It does. 
Anyway, so we need it. That's why God gave it. And even that last sentence there, I want to just reiterate, he didn't have to. We, we, we fall into this entitlement mentality so often to say, you know, well, yeah, of course God did. No, no, he didn't have to. He could have left us condemned on our way to hell and been totally just in the process. So to say that God revealed himself, can, can I say this really fast? Sure I can. Um, so, sorry. So to say, though, when you get up in the morning and say, man, should I avail myself of God's word or sleep? I know sleep's important. I get that. But to recognize again and again, day by day, the God of the universe, by grace, revealed himself in a book with words and sentences and paragraphs that you can avail yourself of is a gift. It's a gift. It is not deserved. It is not owed to you. You're not entitled to it. You and I are entitled to hell. That we have that, man, I get up and just say, thank you, God. Now, early in the morning, I don't often feel that, but I want to say it so I can feel it. God, thank you for revealing yourself in this kind of a way, to know you in this sense. Okay, some practical implications for this, and then we'll come to this question. So, some practical implications for natural revelation. Number one, um, though I would say natural revelation doesn't, is not a way that you can be saved, I would say it is a tool you can use in evangelism. It's a tool. So you're able to establish human responsibility before God. You can point to creation, though they'd suppress it and say, hey, this displays a creator. Conscience and awareness of truth, beauty, and goodness displays an awareness of a creator who made all these things in these ways. It reminds us that we speak of God and sin. We speak what all people know. Though they, again, they suppress those things. It enables us to start with some of the truth they can perceive. To, again, use that as a bridge toward the gospel truth. One example of this, really quick. I worked at a restaurant uh, years ago when I was doing PhD work. Uh, I was a server at this, this upscale restaurant in the downtown area in Virginia. And uh, every employee that was a server besides me were all your age. I was 28, 29, 30 years old, I think it was at that point. And... Uh, everybody was like 20, 21, 22 besides me. I was the old man of the group, I guess. And then the managers were around my age. And uh, so when I interviewed for the job, they knew that I'd been a pastor prior to that for a number of years. Like, what are you doing here? I'm like, this is temporary. I'm going from this to this temporary job. Like, got it, no problem. So they knew that. And it's upscale restaurant. So the chef, and you refer to him as chef, he knew this as well. And chef, his name was Roger. He was a... Uh, he was a, a boisterous man from North Jersey. So he, he was vocal and he had pretty loud volume. And uh, so I would walk by the kitchen some nights. It was an open kind of a kitchen to the area you'd walk by on the way to tables. And he would often shout to me and say, Hey, Rev! How you doing tonight, Rev? He always called me Rev, short for Reverend. And uh, I was like, I'm good, Chef. How you doing? Awesome. Good to see you. And that's what we would often say to each other. And so after a while, my fellow servers began asking, what, why does he call you Rev? Like, what, what's the deal? And I said, well, actually, prior to this, I've been a pastor. And then, I mean, questions then just broke out like crazy. Like, a, pa a pastor of a church? Where? What? And so they had all these questions. Because they're all, all of them, I found out, non-Christians. So one night, uh, there was on the TV, TVs uh, nearby the, the waiting station there, um, Larry King Live, this is a few years back now when he's still on, and he had on uh, a musical artist who uh, at that point had come out as a lesbian and was talking about that, and a pastor. They're in this conversation, and all the subtitles are on there, you know, and I'm trying through all these things, and I'm trying to watch in between my, my serving and see what's, what's being said. Is this pastor doing a good job or not, you know? And uh, my one coworker said, what, what do you think of this conversation? Well, a lot of questions arise with that, so I started telling her uh, some things from Scripture that I would say are convictions of mine and that we should have as Christians. And I, I realized about three or four minutes into that conversation, I looked behind me, and about half a dozen of my coworkers are standing there, listening. Do you all want to join in? No, just keep going, keep going. You know, they want to hear what the Christian pastor has to say about these things because they have different viewpoints on this than I do. So this. Brought this whole conversation. I'm trying to think through, well, you guys would agree with this, this, and this. I'm using some natural revelation categories. 
to help them understand certain things that give way toward this gospel of Jesus. It's a way to try to do that in those ways. Those are fun days. Think of those things, those people. Second, for 99% of you in here, you are in so-called, quote-unquote, secular studies. Praise be to God for Christians who are in every area of life. I praise God for that. That's why I love being here at Cedarville. So we don't need to fear those things. Uh, I hear Christians at times say, oh man, there's not a lot of Christians in in the arts. The arts are a dark place. Have my kids talked about wanting to do that, so I don't, I don't know about that. To which I say, like, yeah, Jesus came to be a light in dark places and calls us to do the same kinds of things in, in all of our occupations. So with that, just to say here, truth should be known in all of its categories. God gave us knowledge on planet Earth to know and to love and to enjoy and to invest in and to use that as a way of always orienting ourselves back toward who God is and what he's done and what he's created. And every area you guys study in is a chance to bring your your studies back toward God-centered ends in in a variety of ways. Presuppositions, findings, conclusions, all those things. So I just want to say there, you don't need to fear the truth and think, oh man, if I go into like the hard sciences, a lot of people would say evolution is true and I wouldn't say that. Right, go for it. Get in there. Do your thing. Right, I'm, I'm a geologist and they wouldn't affirm that. Yeah, get in there. Get after it. Do really good work and and say and show how God orients himself toward rocks. Because he does. Anyway, so that's a key thing to see here as well. Third, uh, briefly here, being good stewards. We should, I mean, just just say this. It it feels as though if you say be good stewards of creation, it's like, oh, are are you some kind of tree hugger? Well, no. I'm just trying to say that God gave us a creation and calls in Genesis 1 to steward it well, so steward it well. That's what I'm trying to say. We, we, it's so polarizing nowadays, it feels like, in that way. We should seek to preserve creation because we're stewards and because it's part of God's self-revelation. In the end, we need to make clear, we don't worship nature. We don't worship the created things, as Romans 1 says. We worship the creator. Creation, guys, is just one opportunity to see through it, creation itself to God. That's all life. You're trying to see through things to God. All things point back to him. From him, through him, to him are how many things? All things. Yes, thank you. So, are you sure? Well, Paul thought so. So I'm going to go with Paul on that. Yeah, all things. Even, you know, this differential equation in calculus? Yes, even that belongs to God. So that's all part of that, that world to recognize as well. In worship, man, for Christians, guys, for worship, man, we, we have this advantage to know we are saved by the living God through Christ, and we can see a creator in all these areas and say, our God is an awesome God. We can say that legitimately and say, I see this all over. His fingerprints are on everything, literally. Right? So you can just see how that works in all of creation. So that should a natural religion coupled with special revelation? Should I have there uh, elicit the kind of elation in the Psalms? He read the Psalms? Of course you have. It's amazing to me how the psalmist praises the degree to which they praise God and to say, let's follow suit and see what they see and praise God. And natural revelation can also bring about the kind of terror Experienced by Job. Do you recall last time, Job 38, 41? Remember this? Just read all those chapters sometime and see. God's trying to say, did you make this? Did you create this? Were you there when I did this and 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 this? No, you weren't. So he said last time, right? God is a sovereign God whom we can trust. You want to recognize that as well. Maybe you're like me. And somebody in some class uh, made some mention of a scenario like, what about the guy who's on an island? You ever heard this scenario before? Anybody besides me? It's always a guy, and it's always an island. I don't know why. Like, can he have a peninsula? I don't know. Um, why? Well, the guy on the island who never has access to a Bible and all these things, can't he 
or she, and that, can't they see in creation something and say, I can derive from these kinds of observable truths, there's a God, and get toward salvation? That's a legitimate question to ask, particularly if you are well-schooled in the doctrine of hell. And I think sometimes we forget, we've heard this taught, I hope in your churches you have, that hell is real, inescapable, and eternal. That's true. Got a lot of text to go there with that. And there, there is something, let's just be honest here, if you, if you think for a while on the reality of what hell is, there is something unnerving about that, and rightfully so. Ten years ago, eleven years ago now, wow, eleven years ago, I preached the funeral for my grandmother who died, as far as I know, an agnostic. Didn't want to know God, didn't want to love God, didn't want to submit to God. Her stance in life was her husband died in his mid-30s of a heart attack, just dropped dead one day, gone. And her stance was, if there is a God, I hate him. So, so for us, my mom got miraculously saved in college through my dad's testimony, actually. It was really interesting, really neat to see. Praise God for good heritage. Um, but they would go to her house and share the gospel, and she said, you have two options. You can shut your mouth or you can leave. Those are your options. That was my grandma all my life. When she passed away 11 years ago, my aunt called me and said, would you please preach the funeral? That's a hard thing, friends. That was a really hard thing. And so I go there and try to think through, what do I say? 99% of that audience does not know Jesus. She, as far as I know, does not know Jesus. So hell is not theoretical to me. I feel that I know who have passed on from this life, that as far as I know, they did not know Jesus. So when I say these things to you, please know I'm not saying them flippantly. I'm not saying them heartlessly. I'm trying to convey what's true from God's word. Sincerely, I want you to know that. So ask questions, let's fire away and think through this. But I'm trying to get to the heart of God. Who are you? And what have you said in your word? And I want to be faithful to that. That's where we're going. So here's, here's some thoughts on this. Question is often raised. Uh, and again, it's understandable why we'd ask that question. If natural relation is only sufficient for accountability and condemnation, some may say, how could God send someone to hell who's never heard the gospel? The, the real question behind the question is, how is that fair? That's the word I often hear used. Well, how would that be fair? Let me just say, from the get-go, we don't get to define fair. God defines fair. And we submit to that. There have been three options talked about in church history. Here, here are the three that are mentioned. Universalism, inclusivism, and exclusivism. I, I imagine you've heard of at least two of those probably. So in terms of salvation, uh, someone says, I'm a universalist. What do you think they mean by that? Who, who gets saved in that category? Everybody, yeah. So in terms of universalism, we'd say, okay, that's a category where we would affirm that all people are going to be saved by God. Now, it could be immediately. It could be they go through some kind of um, process of maybe purging or they're in hell for a time, but it's not eternal. It could be a variety of ways you think through that, but at the end of the day, you'd say, okay, uh, it's universalistic. Everyone's going to be getting in. Probably the most well-known uh, most recent, it's some years old now, rendition of this is in a book by, popularized at least, is in a book by Rob Bell called Love Wins. So in that book, Rob Bell argues uh, for a, in a popular way for a universalist kind of approach to this doctrine to say, well, in the end, God's love wins over everyone and eventually they come to heaven. Inclusivism. Have you heard of inclusivism and know what that one's referring to? Yeah. Josh. Oh, um, I'm sorry, you have a question? Or, uh, no. Go ahead. <laughs> um, uh, doesn't it just refer to the fact that it is possible to uh, attain salvation through natural revelation? Not necessarily that everybody would, but that it's possible. Yes, so that view would affirm and say it's possible to attain salvation through natural revelation, and most often it's talked about in this way that, okay, 
You're going to do that and see that done within religious kinds of confines. So put it this way, if you are a sincere Muslim who is seeking out as best they can by natural relation, they have, they're, they're embedded in Iran, no access to a missionary or the gospel, but they're doing as best they can, they're trying to seek God, this is the means they know how to do that, God's going to look at that and say, that's, that's sufficient. You can be saved by that means. That's called inclusivism. A really well-known version of that, actually, literarily, would be in C.S. Lewis's Last Battle. You guys recall Emmett from The Last Battle? So, a couple of quotes here. Uh, if, you haven't, if you haven't read Lewis's The Last Battle, last of the Narnia series, take up and read. Anyway, so, um, Emmett is a telemarine, I believe. Right? So he's, he's not a... Uh, uh, Aslan-fearing Narnian. And Aslan is this Christ figure in the Narnia series. But he's very religious. He worships the god Tash, that they all worship, very closely. Uh, when the old Narnia passes away and the new Narnia comes, all the characters we know are there, but surprisingly, Emmett's there. And we're saying, what's this Tash worshiper doing in Aslan's country? And uh, Lewis says, by means of Aslan, he says... Uh, Aslan says to this guy, Emmett, what you rendered as worship to Tash, I now see as rendered unto me. Well, that's an inclusivist statement. And he says, beloved, unless your desire had been for me, you would not have sought so long and so truly, for all find what they truly seek. Those are dangerous words. So, People, people ask the question, like, was Lewis an inclusivist? Well, it's fiction, so you can't really say. Well, let me just say, friends, those are inclusivistic words, okay? That, that's a literary uh, example of inclusivism. You worship some other god, some other way, you're doing the best you can, and that renders your pathway into heaven. Make sense? Yeah. And how did they reconcile, like, the cross and salvation? Now, these are all good. I, I agree with you, yes. So we're going there in a second, but just say, they would say the cross... <laughs> Like Clark Pinnock is a well-known inclusivist. Uh, the cross is the means by which the door is opened for what I've just described to be the case. So the cross is not the means of just saying you must affirm Jesus Christ alone for salvation by faith. It's saying Christ died for the world in a way that the door is open, and if you're pursuing God through the gospel, certainly, but also by these other means, the door is open to you. That's how they would see that. Now, let me, because you're like, whoa, wait a second. I, I know, I'm, I'm with you. So let me go there as well to say the last category, uh, exclusivism, is, is what it sounds like, right? So, I mean, just to be fair here as well, if you are an adherent of as Islam, uh, they are exclusivists, right? You have to see, like they would say, the way in which you are in the right with Allah is by this one means. So they also are that kind of uh, view of this. For Christians, we would say exclusivism claims that God does reveal himself again in creation. It's not sufficient to save us. So we need to see through scripture, faith in Jesus alone is what saves us. So again, universalism, everybody, inclusivism, sincere adherence to religious beliefs through natural relation and all these means. And then exclusivists, it's by faith alone in Jesus alone that you're saved. Those are three categories. Now, I mean, I'll just, I like to put cards on the table so you all know where I, where I am with these things. I think you can guess probably, I, I hope anyways, I am an exclusivist, a Christian one at that. That Jesus Christ is the only means, the only way of salvation in this sense. So here, here's why, a few reasons why I would say I am an exclusivist and leave some time for any questions you guys have beyond this as well. First two here. First, as, as a few men, already mentioned, the Bible presents an array of verses that point toward the traditional, say, the exclusivist view. Universalism and inclusivism are not, are not major, are not majority positions. Exclusivism has been the majority position in church history 2,000 years. So there are verses, can, and you guys can see the references there, but can you quote any verses that would indicate it seems like Jesus is the one means of salvation? Can you quote any? Oh, top of your head? Yeah. When Jesus in John says, I'm the way and the truth and life, no one comes to the Father but through me. Yeah, yeah. So John 14, verse 6, he's this one way, truth, and life. No one, I take that as no one, comes to the Father except through him. 
Read John 14 to 17, this upper room discourse, and see, we'll read all of John. The, the issue is faith in Jesus. Through Jesus means faith in Jesus. Yes? And the passage that came to mind was um, in Acts, where Paul found the, these people yes. speaking to an unknown God. Yes. And he says, I see That's that you are worshiping this. Let me tell you about it. Yes. So he didn't leave them there to say, hey, well, that would be sufficient for you to get to this pantheon of gods who's an unknown God. That'll get you there. He works his way from creation to the living God, eventually to the resurrected Christ. Why would Paul do that? I think because he believes that the one way of salvation is Jesus and faith in him. Uh, Acts 4.12, there's no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. And that name is Jesus. A few others there as well. We'll come back to Romans 10 because that's an important one to get to as well. Because I want to challenge us with this at the end. Second, natural revelation is universally available, but again, suppressed. That's what we do with that revelation. In the one example, biblically, where someone seems like they have this general knowledge and they're trying to worship God, this is Cornelius in Acts 10. You guys recall Cornelius? He's a Gentile. It says he's a, he's a God-fearer. He's offering uh, incense offerings to the Lord. God doesn't leave him there. What does he do? He sends Peter this crazy vision of a sheet coming down with unclean animals and says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter's like, I, I don't eat unclean food, Lord. And it happens three times, and it goes away. And he's like, what? That, that's what happens. And then he gets a knock on the door, and two Gentile men say, you got to come with us. Cornelius wants to talk to you. He's, he's like, an angel talked to him and said to send for you. you got to come with us. And he's like, let's see, a vision about unclean animals. You guys are gent. I think I should go. So he, he goes, right? And uh, what does Peter do? Oh, you're a God-fearer? You offer these offerings? You're good. You're fine. Read Acts 10. Peter preaches the gospel of Jesus. This is what he does. And they believe, and the same thing happened in Acts 2, happens in Acts 10 to Gentiles. So we see the need there for their gospel as well. Then third and fourth. Third, inclusivism. Assumes that many individuals are honestly and sincerely seeking God. That's that man on the island scenario. He's on the island, he has no access, but he's, he's seeking. So let me read you some familiar verses. Romans 3, verse 10 says, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. This is verse 11 here. No one seeks for God. All turn aside, and together they become worthless. No one does good, not even one. This is in the context of where Paul says we take creation and twist it to our own forms of worship. We don't worship the living God. So Romans 3 is clear to indicate that's not how we are. We don't seek for God. Apart from the Spirit's conviction and illumination, we don't seek Him. But when the Word of God and the Spirit of God fly in tandem to infiltrate a heart by the preaching of the Word, people can then have their eyes open to see the glories of Christ and say yes to that. But it requires the word. I'll go back to Romans 10 here. Well, I'll just do Romans 10 now. Romans 10, verse 1. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they be saved. He, see the fellow, his fellow Jews here? He wants to see them come to faith in Jesus' as Messiah. And then verse 13, everyone knows this verse. But for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then it goes on. How then... Will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? And he quotes Isaiah here, just past the verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So this last point here, while the New Testament motivation of evangelism is for the glory of God as well as the need of the lost, the command to go preach the gospel, Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, John 21, Acts 1, Acts 10, or sorry, Romans 10, all these areas, the command to go and preach the gospel does not fit well with the idea that salvation is possible apart from the preaching of the gospel. In other words, here, here's the, the issue, guys. The issue is 
Can someone be saved by means of natural revelation? No. They must hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ specifically, repent of their sin, and put their faith in Jesus Christ. That is the one means of salvation. Those who never hear the gospel are condemned in their sin. To which again, people say, that's unfair. And I want to say to you, the same book that contains Romans 1, that says, so they are without excuse, contains Romans 10, which says, how will they hear without someone preaching? So I want to say to us, beyond the philosophical thoughts, to consider our lives as being spent in some way to make the gospel known to those who are around us. And friends, that can be overseas. And can I say as well, if you go to an urban setting, the nations are coming to us in droves. Go to Minneapolis, oh my goodness, and walk downtown in Minneapolis and recognize, am I in America or Saudi Arabia? There are so many from that area of the world, a Hmong population, so many that are there that need the gospel that are here. Go to Detroit, y'all. Go there and see those things. So just to say, I get philosophically, we have questions there, but that's also a gospel call.